right, well, we come to our seventh session in our series, Meeting the Messiah. And so we're going to pick up where we left off last week. We're going to begin in verse 19 of the 10th chapter. But as we remember, again, all of this is following. All of this is kind of right on the footsteps of the man born blind being given eyes to see. And now this dispute with the Pharisees, and now many Jews are gathered to, around, okay? So in verse 19, it says, therefore there was a division among the Jews. Now sometimes in John's gospel, he, when he uses the term the Jews, many times anyway, that's the Pharisees. You know, Jesus' dialogue is certainly with just the Pharisees, but the Jews are around, you know, everybody's around, you know, and this is in Jerusalem. So essentially, now everybody, now there's a division between everybody, just as there's a division between everybody now. Some say he's a sinner. You know, no one here, no one here misunderstands Jesus and doesn't understand that Jesus is claiming to be God. You know, essentially, it's just exactly what they accuse him of being. And we will get to that in due time. But nobody is misunderstanding Jesus. Some say he's a sinner because he breaks the Sabbath and so on. And others say he must be sent of God. You know, and, and that was the understanding that the blind man had, right? You know, who he healed one who was born blind. When have we ever heard about this? In all of history, this man is doing works of God. And God wouldn't allow a demon to do this. So there was a division among all the Jews because of these sayings. And many of them said, he has a demon and is mad. This man, again, this, this is the, <laughs> these are the options. These are the options. He's a demon and he's insane. Why do you listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who has a demon. Right? Demons don't speak like this. <laughs> and demons also don't heal anyone. I don't know if you've noticed this, Pharisees. But that's not how this goes down. You know, not only are his words of God, but his works are of God. And it's just as Jesus says, and as he will say, if you can't believe me for my words, believe me for my works. The works that I do are my Father's works. I and my Father are one, which is what he says. But these are the options. These are the options. Either he is demon, Either he is a devil and insane, or he's the son of God. There is no other option. And again, only those who were born blind, we we're all born blind, but only those who are given eyes to see, ears to hear, know that he is not only sent by God, but he is God. He is God. There's, in theological terms, this is perichoesis, and that's the Greek term for it. This, this has to do with this mutual indwelling within the Godhead. That the Father is in the Son and the Spirit. The Son is in the Father and the Spirit. The Spirit is in the Father and the Son. So this is, this is, this is a, an indwelling of three persons and one God. And one God. So when he says, I and my Father are one, that goes right back to what he had said. I am in the Father and the Father is in me. And let us never forget what he says in his prayer in chapter 17. Father, may they be one, even as we are one. The unity of the church, truly the wheat, are united. We might not be united in doctrine. We might disagree on some things. But Jesus is our shepherd. And we are one because of him. So, when he prayed that prayer, that prayer was answered and that prayer was fulfilled. We are one in our shepherd and the God is one in three persons. Let's continue. Now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem and it was winter. Okay. Um, John brings up many feast days. We see, we, obviously, the crucifixion is during the feast of Passover. Jesus fulfills all these feasts, okay? The, the Pentecost is the feast of the harvest, 
you know, the ingathering and so on. That's where the Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, that, the faithful fulfillment of the day of Pentecost, day of Pente the day of Passover and so forth. This feast, though, you will scour the Old Testament and never find it. Because this actually began to be celebrated in the intertestamental period. The Syrian Antiochus IV Epiphanes um, invaded Jerusalem in 167 BC and set up a pagan altar, desecrated the temple. And then, by the revolution, essentially led by Judas Maccabeus and all the Maccabees, but Judas the Hammer, which I think is just awesome, Judas the Hammer regained the, the, the temple. And so they reconsecrated, they dedicated it on the 25th of their month, which corresponds to December. I think this is mostly why we celebrate Christmas on the 25th of December, because of the Feast of Dedication, the light of the world, because this is the festival, festival of lights as well. So this is Hanukkah. The Feast of Dedication is Hanukkah. It's celebrated for eight days. It's an eight-day festival. It's an eight-day feast, essentially. And again, it's because they dedicated the temple there. And remember, John has already recorded for us, Jesus saying, destroy this temple. In three days, I'll build it up again. Jesus is the temple. Christ is the temple. And he is also the light of the world. He comes and fulfills all these feasts. So that's all I'm going to say. We don't have all the time in the world to go through all these things. But it's a beautiful, beautiful illustration. If Jesus fulfills not only the feasts of the Old Testament, but in between these testaments, God acted. God acted. In the Maccabean Revolt, they got their temple back, and then Herod restored it greatly. It became one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and so on. Wonderful, wonderful fulfillment. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Where else have we seen this? This is where the apostles begin to preach and do miracles. Jesus is at that self-same place. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ... Tell us plainly. And I can't help but read, the, but read this verse and go immediately to the Diet of Worms. I'm sure that happens to everybody. <laughs> go back to the Diet of Worms where, you know, Martin Luther was commanded to recant of his works. And he's like, well, which one? Certainly you're not asking me to recant everything I've ever said. Some of that you have to, you know, realize is true. So which one? And they, Eck essentially told him, Martin Luther, answer non permutum, without horns, without horns, answer us plainly, answer us plainly. And essentially, that's what they're saying. How long will you leave us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Now, we saw with the Samaritan woman, he answered her plainly. I who am speaking to you am he. With the man born blind, same thing, same thing. Immediately confesses himself as the Messiah. To those who don't have eyes to see. Remember, he came to shut the eyes of those who say they see and to open the eyes of those who can't see. So these blind ones, these blind ones, he's doing these works. He's saying these things. All these things testify of him. He's already said, I am my father. Of what? You know, I am in the father and the father is in me. Okay. The works that I do, I do in my father's name. Essentially, they are authorized my power comes from my Father. So I've already told you, okay? And that's what he says. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe because you're blind. Those who have eyes to see now, those who the Holy Spirit is now indwelling, sees that I am the Messiah. <laughs> These works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. This is my witness. If I were my own witness, we'd seen him say this too. My witness wouldn't be true, but another is my witness. And then he uses John the Baptist. But God the Father is, vindic is, is, is authorizing <laughs> Jesus by his works. Not only his miracles, but in all of the, the ministry of Jesus Christ is to honor the Father, is to honor his Father. So, because you are not, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. 
as I said to you, literally, he said that, so I'm not throwing that in. As I said to you, I've already told you this. You don't believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep know me and they know my voice and they always follow me. And he goes on, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Again, we, we spoke about that somewhat last week. And I give them eternal life, abundant life. This is the abundant life that he promised. Yes, I told you, it is also his righteousness. It's an abundant life. It is a full life, but it is also one that will last for eternity. That candle will never go out. That light will never fade. It will continue forever. I give them eternal life, eternal abundant life in me, filled by the Lamb of God, by the light of the world. And they shall never, never perish Never. They are mine. I know my sheep. I love my sheep. I will never perish. I am everlasting. Is what Christ saying, obviously. I am everlasting. I will never perish. And they are in me. I have come to find my sheep. And my sheep know me. You don't believe because you are not of my flock. Again, remember, he said, I have other sheep who are not of this flock. Other translations have fold. It, the better rendering is flock. Okay, we didn't get into that because we're limited in time. However, you are not of my flock. Therefore, you don't believe. You, you say you see. You say you were disciples of Moses and so on. If you would have believed Moses, you would have believed me. You were blind and you are not of my flock. Otherwise, you would know my voice and you would follow me. <clears throat> Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Here he's saying, none, they will never be snatched out of my hand. Remember, he says, he says that he is committed to his saints, and he will never lose one. Remember, he says, Father, all that you have given me, I have not lost one. None of, nobody can snatch them out of his hands. Once they are in the shepherd, once they are in the sheepfold, he has protected us. You know, the greatest shepherd, <laughs> the greatest possible shepherd in our imagination would be the shepherd who can't die. The greatest king in all of heavens and earth is the king that cannot die. The Lord of Lords, must be a Lord who cannot die. He laid his life down so that he can take it up again. He has the power to lay it down. He has the power to take it up again. Truly the authority and the ability to lay it down. I lay it down of my own will and I take it up again by my own will, by the will of my Father because he has given me the power and the ability and the authority to do this. So he did lay down his life for his sheep. But now this shepherd cannot die. Neither can his sheep. Neither can his flock. No one will snatch them out of his hand. And he says, no one can snatch them out of my hand. No, and my father, who is greater than all, no one is going to snatch them out of his hand. I and my father are one. Now, briefly, this has led into much controversy, much heresy. Arius used this verse. And the Arians of today, Jehovah's Witnesses, um, some sects of Mormonism, um, see that this, is, <laughs> this unity is one in purpose, and, that, and that's it. But Jesus is not God. This is just one in one mind together. They're, they're united in purpose. What an absurd saying, and this is why he was condemned as a heretic, that, that is an absolute heresy. Everything Christ says is obviously proclaiming his oneness with his Father. John, in the beginning of this book, the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. There's, there's a distinction of person, and the Word was God. Now, this I and my Father are one. In the Greek, this is in the neuter. Okay, so that, that really means a difference in person. Okay, where if it were in the masculine, then it would be one in, in complete identity. 
In other words, the same person, okay? But there's, this is saying they are one in identity, essentially, but different in person, you know, distinct in person anyway. But he, they are of one will. Again, all that my Father commands me, I do. This is an eternal command obedience relationship. This, and the Son does nothing apart from His Father's will. This is the Son of God. He will do nothing. In a sense, He can do nothing apart from His Father's will. But His Father gives Him all the authority, all the power, all the ability to do the works that He commands Him to do. I and my Father are one. No one's snatching them out of our hands. They are ours. They are ours. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works I have shown from my Father. Again, these are works from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? You know, they've done this before. Remember, he's evaded them before. But here, he doesn't just simply evade them. He, you know, stops time for a little bit, you know, but stops them in their tracks with this question, this somewhat interrogation. They've been interrogating him, and he kind of turns the tables. Then the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. This is what we alluded to briefly last week, so let me briefly just say here, this again is the irony of ironies, and if Arius or the Jehovah's Witnesses had eyes to see, they would see he is saying right here, <laughs> and they are saying right here, you are making yourself to be God. And the reverse <laughs> is the truth. God in eternity chose to send his son to come in the flesh so that we might behold his glory, the glory of the only begotten son of God, just as John has already said. So, but the Jews understand what he's saying. Okay, and he answered them, it is, not, is it not written in your law, I said, you were, ye are gods, this is in Psalm 82, um, briefly, Se beginning in verse 6, says, I said, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. However, in the seventh verse, it says, but you shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. Okay, so right here, he's saying, okay, let me, let's continue first. You were gods. If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. He says that in like parentheses, and the scriptures cannot be broken. Do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? Okay, now, this verse, you are God's. I mean, this was most likely originally men mentioning the judges. Actually, the unfaithful judges, but those who would lead um, Israel, essentially however unfaithfully, but sometimes, you know, it's, it's referred to angels, and so on. Um, but at this time, while he's discussing this with the Jews, the Jews would understand this is that all of Israel, all of Israel. And let's remember, Israel is also called the Son of God, because Jesus is the true Israel, okay? However, so I see this as meaning all to whom the Father has sent his word to, all those who receive his word. So this is a difference between those who receive and the, he who is sent. So in other words, he's saying, if he says this about those who receive the word, you know, this somewhat ambiguous El Elohim, some, something that can be equivalent to angels. He says, if he says this about those who receive the word of God, how much more would he be saying of he whom he sends of himself? If and the scripture can't be broken, and if he says this of him, uh, of them, much more, he says this of me. This isn't blasphemy. This is far from blasphemy. Again, I'm not proclaiming, I'm not making myself God. I have never made myself God. I am everlasting. I am of everlasting, and I came in the form of a man, in the form of a slave, essentially. But if I do, if I do not do, do the works of my father, do not believe me. These testify of me. Remember, he already said that. 
But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Therefore they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand because his hour has not yet come. You know, John, we're never given, re you know, how he evades them. It's by the providence and the faithfulness of God. His hour had not come. Most of John, most of the gospel of John actually has to do with the crucifixion of Christ. But here he's, he's speaking of his works. Again, not miracles alone, but certainly miracles are included with that. As the prophets were saying, the blind will see, the lame will walk and dance like a gazelle, like a deer, and so on, and the deaf will hear, the dead will be given life, and Lazarus follows this chapter. Just before the end of his public ministry, but this, the last portion in this chapter and he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first, and there he stayed. Then many came to him and said, John performed no sign, but all the things that John spoke about this man were true, and many believed in him there. So Jesus goes back to where his ministry began. His ministry, his public ministry is about to conclude. He returns to the place where this began. Essentially, this would be a safer place. The Tetrarch Philip was in charge, and more lenient than Herod, and so on. But he returns to the place where his public ministry began. Um, but my favorite commentary, uh, easily, is that of D.A. Carson, Donald Carson. I've, I've met, mentioned him before. He's the one from Canada. Love the guy. Uh, I've learned much from him. Uh, but his commentary on the book of on the Gospel of John, made me shed some tears. I don't know how I missed this, but where they say, many came to him and said, John performed no sign. John the Baptist performed no sign. And this time he's, he's been executed. He's been beheaded as we remember. So John performed no sign. But all the things, all the things that John, <clears throat> that John spoke about this man. We're sure. What an epitaph. I, I pray to God. That's all of our epitaphs, but certainly any, any minister of God, any true faith, anyone who wants to be a true faithful minister of God, prays that that's what will be said of us when we are gone, when we pass the veil at last. What an amazing testimony. All the things that John spoke about this man were true. Everything. He said, he's the Lamb of God. I'm not worthy to untie his shoes. The axe is laid at the root of the tree. His winnowing fan is in his hand. This is about to take place, and I baptize you with water. That's as much as I can do, <laughs> okay? I don't have any power. This one's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, fire, eternal life, eternal life. Well, we will not only not perish from this fire, we will live forever in this fire and in this spirit. But what a wonderful conclusion to this chapter as we <laughs> began the journey to the cross, this whole thing is a journey to the cross but just before his final and greatest work of raising Lazarus from the tomb, commanding him to come out of that wretched place and to come and live with him and abide in him forever because he will never perish away. There's an anecdotal story about Lazarus, actually, because the, the Jews seek to kill him afterward <laughs> because this is inconvenient. <laughs> you know, they truly seek to kill Lazarus as well. And there's this anecdotal story talking about Lazarus just losing it. And he just begins to erupt in laughter. And they get all frustrated. And he essentially says, you seek to kill me? Death has died. <laughs> you know, death has died. And Christ has killed him. I laugh at the death now. I know where I'm going. 
I am, I live forever. My eternal life begins now. It is here. It is now. We will never perish from his hand. No one, no one can snatch them out of his hand. He is the only way into the sheepfold. He is the only way into the green pastures, into the still waters. And he is the one that guides us. He is the one that tends to us. But he and he alone is also the one that preserves us. Again, the perseverance of the saints is a biblical doctrine because it's only biblical because God preserves his saints. The perseverance of the saints rests on the foundation of the preservation of God to his saints and for his saints because no one is able to snatch us out of his hands. He is faithful. He is absolutely faithful. He sent his son for us. He has sought out his lost sheep. And the true shepherd has come and laid down his life and taken it up again so that we are safe forever with our shepherd, with our king, who came to serve for us. And when we are at last at that table, when we sup to, and drink with the true Lamb of God, we will never perish. We will never perish. And we will always, we will always be in the radiant light of the Lamb, who is the light of the world. So, as we conclude with our consideration of the of the interactions with Jesus, at least in the Gospel of John, we will continue. We will go to the Synoptic Gospels, however, and talk about many interactions found there. We might return with Pontius Pilate later, um, because again, this is many people anyway who meet with Messiah. And so the chief priests will be included with that. And that's why we included the Pharisees. Pilate will be included with that. And we will likely do uh, consider Nicodemus as well. So we will return to this gospel. But here is the great sermon, the great message about our good shepherd. Again, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. How can I possibly want when the Lord is my shepherd? I am in him and he is in me. He dwells with us. He makes his house with his saints, and he is our dwelling place. He is our dwelling place, and he makes his home with us because he is our father, and he wants to be with his children now and forever. Praise God. Mm -hmm.